Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Mahul Pandey uh, to give today's lecture. She's going to tell us about axial anomaly in the SU Engage matrix model. So thank you, you may begin. Okay, thank you, Danjo, and thanks to everyone for being here today. So today I am going to talk about a result that we recently found, and it's just been put up on archive awaiting uh, the journal, but um, this uh, concerns, as the title says, the presence of the U1 axial anomaly in a matrix model, a quantum mechanical matrix model version of yang -Mills theory. And this is joint work with uh, Nirmal Indu Acharya, who is currently in the faculty of IIT Bhuvaneshwar, and also Sachin, who is here with us today. So first, let me give a quick introduction of why we were motivated to study this matrix model and to study the axial anomaly in it. So we are all familiar with yang mills theory. It's the it's a large class of non-abelian gauge theories based on gauge group SUN. And it uh, underlies basically most important theories in nature, specifically QCD, the study of uh, the theory underlying uh, part quarks and gluons in particle physics. And also the degrees of freedom are gauge fields, which transform under the gauge group SUN. The transformation is shown here. So, and we work on the gauge configuration space, which is um, which is obtained by identifying all uh, all the gauge fields which are related to each other by the gauge transformation. So this gives uh, the configuration space as the set of gauge fields quotiented by the action of the gauge group. But uh, but Yang Mills theory is also difficult. This is because it is, of course, infinite dimensional. It's nonlinear because of the uh, non abelianness and the constraint, the gauge constraints are non holonomic. Also, it makes the <coughs> configuration space uh, have non trivial topology. In fact, we are might be familiar with the Gribov problem that it is impossible to make a global gate choice. Also, there are properties like asymptotic freedom, which makes uh, yang mills theory very strongly coupled at low energy regimes. And that is where uh, we, that is where physical particles are. So, but it makes the study of yang mills theory and its spectrum very hard at this regime. So what we, wanted to do is to define, uh, come up with a simpler, a much simpler, much more crude, if you may say, approximation of yang mills theory and see, uh, and try to extract as much information as we could from just this simple approximation, which led us to the matrix model. So the matrix model is basically the dimension of yang mills field theory. So uh, the spatial R3 is compactified to S3 with the time direction still being the real line. But, but then we dimensionally reduce so that the gauge fields are completely independent of space and only depend on time. And this was obtained uh, by, uh, this was uh, the first work was uh, in this, uh, in this context was by Narasimhan and Ramdas in 1979, and then was developed into a matrix model by Bal, Sachin, uh, and so on in 2014. And uh, basically they, they considered only the subset of left invariant gauge fields on, on the three sphere. And uh, if you do that, then what you obtain is uh, just, uh, is a bunch of gauge fields that are expressible in terms of spatially independent finite dimensional matrices, which only depend on time. And then the, the action that you get, and in fact, the Hamiltonian that you get is a purely quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. But this is nothing but the dimensional reduction of the full field theory uh, into zero plus one dimensions. But it was in no way trivial. In fact, it was shown that um, it does capture the underlying, the, 
the topologic, the non-trivial topology of the fully angles theory, namely the gauge bundle was non-trivial, so it was impossible to fix a global section which lies at the heart of the Gribov problem. But, and um, furthermore, we further studied this model in, uh, and saw that even though this is such a drastic approximation of QCD, we have basically discarded all, mom all higher momentum modes and all spatial information and restricted it to only the zero modes. But uh, however, it is still robust enough that it can capture non-trivial information. And uh, in particular, there were, we made a recent study of the SU3 version of the matrix model, and we extracted the light hadron spectrum from it using variational methods. And we used it to give predictions from, for light, meson, and baryon masses. And what we found that our predictions, even though our model was completely quantum mechanical, they were very strong. The, in fact, the light baryon masses were uh, predicted within about 10% of accuracy. And most light meson masses were within 30% accuracy when you compared with the, uh, the physical, the, uh, the experimental data. So <clears throat> this is a brief summary. I gave a talk about this a few a couple of years ago but just to remind everyone this was a summary and as you can see these are our these were our predictions and uh, within the error bars the matching with the experimental values were very close so this encouraged us to treat this matrix model as uh, as a strong candidate for a low energy effective theory for qcd however to make that stronger statement, we have to first uh, make sure that uh, the symmetry properties of the full field theory are, uh, are also satisfied in the matrix model approximation. Specifically, we should be able to see chiral symmetry breaking and we should be able to see the axial anomaly. So this present letter, axial anomaly as we show, is present in this quantum mechanical model. And so to give a review, um, an anomaly is a symmetry of a classical theory that fails to survive when you, in the quantum theory. And so in massless Young-Mills theory, in Young -Mills theory with massless fermions, the classical action has a, a vector uh, rotation symmetry, vector U1 symmetry and an axial U1 symmetry. And uh, in the quantum theory, the first one survives, but the latter is anomalously broken and the axial U1 uh, current is not conserved. And what we show is that this occurs in the matrix model as well. And this, is, this was surprising because the matrix model uh, by nature is, not, is very different from the field theory. In fact, the vacuum structure is very different as, as we'll show later that uh, even though QCD has an infinite number of uh, degenerate vacua labeled by the integer integers, but the matrix model only has, uh, for a given gauge group, it only has a finite number of vacua. And even instant on charges, they are given by just a finite set of integers. But even so, it is uh, it does pick up the axial anomaly. And how we are going to show that is, we first find the instantons in the matrix. Uh, we show that in presence of an instanton background, we show that the, the measure of the Euclidean fermionic path integral under an axial rotation, it is not conserved, but it picks up a non-trivial phase. And this phase, as we shall show, is equal to the index of the Dirac operator in this instant on background. And this, this is, uh, and so for a non-zero index of the Dirac operator, the Euclidean path integral is not conserved and this is what leads to an, an anomaly. So basically we are using, uh, we are doing a version of Fujikawa's method for showing the anomaly in Young-Mills theory. So, 
so I'll start with just a brief overview of how the matrix model is constructed. Then we will describe the instant terms in the matrix model. We will describe its vacuum structure. Then we will set up the index of the Dirac operator in the background of an instant term. And then we will show how the fermion measure changes in and how it is related to the index and the instant term. And finally, we will, uh, so we, uh, we start off by just considering fundamental fermions, but we, we show that this, uh, this anomaly comes about the same way for adjoint fermions as well, which is useful for supersymmetric theories. So let's uh, start. So first, how the matrix model is constructed. So what? Uh, so the spatial uh, sphere is mapped isomorphically to an SU2 subgroup of SUN, which um, identifies the vector fields on SU2 with those uh, generating transition on S3. And then we consider this uh, general left invariant form on SUN. You can see that this is the most general form of a left invariant uh, vector field or left invariant form uh, where G, are, G is an element of SUN and M is a general N square minus one dimensional real matrix. And then uh, we get the local gauge fields uh, or uh, the gauge fields on S3 via the pullback of omega under this map. And also the curvature via the pullback of the structure equation, D omega, plus omega wedge omega, but this gives uh, AI, the, the gauge fields in terms of uh, finite dimensional, in fact, three times n square minus one dimensional real matrices. And uh, these are completely, uh, these have no, uh, these are uh, independent of space for, uh, for a left invariant one form. And uh, these only, this can only depend on time. And so the curvature is also defined. So this this part, the commutator part is the usual commutator. And there is one part coming from the curvature of uh, the sphere. So this minus epsilon i j k a k is coming from the fact that we are working on the sphere. So also because we have, uh, because none of our arguments depend on the, the radius of the sphere, we are working on a, on a unit sphere, so, but we can of course always put back the radius by a simple dimensional analysis. So in fact, this term would come with a one by R factor. Uh, anyway, uh, we also introduce a parallel transporter to define gauge covariant time derivative, which transforms as uh, under a gauge, gauge transformation by H in this way, and which enables us to define the electric and the magnetic field. And then uh, the Lagrangian is uh, just the trace of E squared minus B squared. Um, so what we obtain is uh, yang mills potential, which has cubic, a quartic, and a quadratic term. So the quartic term is again familiar, but the, the other terms come uh, from, the, from the curvature of the sphere. So anyway, this is the basic setup. This is the matrix model that we are working with. Now that we have it, we can study the vacuum, the classical vacuum structure. In fact, the classical vacuum. And oh, before we uh, start, we uh, before we talk about that, let's just introduce quarks. So quarks are uh, represented by spinners, Grassmann valued spin uh, matrices that again depend only on time, and they transform in the fundamental representation of color, and in the spin half representation of uh, spatial rotations. And they couple to the gauge fields via minimal coupling through this Dirac Lagrangian. <clears throat> and well, so now we we first make we first arrive at the Euclidean action. For this, we just make a wick rotation and uh, integrate over the Euclidean time. So this gives us the Euclidean part of the Yang Mills theory. 
uh, we have also set the coupling constant to be one because that's also uh, none of our results depends on the explicit value of it. We don't have any flows also in the in the parameter in the coupling, so we can set it to be one. And <clears throat> we have this Euclidean Dirac uh, action where the Dirac operator is defined as this. So the Euclidean Dirac operator is given by this equation. So the Euclidean action again is invariant under the axial rotation uh, explicitly e to, by e to the i alpha gamma five. But as we shall see, quantum effects break the axial symmetry. In fact, if we consider the Euclidean path integral, the measure of the fermion, uh, the fermions is not invariant. But before we go into that, let us study first the Yang Mills, S Euclidean Yang Mills. And in fact, let's study its vacuum structure. So classical vacuum configurations are solutions where the Yang Mills potential disappears. It is uh, given by when the matrices, the gauge fields uh, form a representation of SU2. So, but these representations do not need to be irreducible. In fact, they they can be uh, they can be any generator of the Lie algebra of SU2. And for each, um, so for SUN, these matrices are n-dimensional and uh, in, in general, but we get a vacuum whenever this, this n-dimensional matrix is an embedding of an SU2 generator in n-dimensions. And uh, instantons are finite action solutions of the equation of motion from uh, S Euclidean. And what they do is that they form, ton they are solutions which tunnel between the degenerate vacua uh, between uh, uh, the infinite past and the infinite future. So the finite action solution, so SC, uh, YM is extremized when when E, the Euclidean electric field is equal to plus minus uh, the magnetic field. And the solutions with plus or minus give the self-dual and then the self-dual instant. So, if we plug in A's in the self-dual and anti-self-dual equation, then we obtain this and uh, gen and we solve it. So a general instant on solution is given of this form. Phi of tau contains the instant on profile, and L i are um, are reduced L i one and L i two are two different reducible representations of uh, the SU2 algebra in n dimensions. Each of them is actually a direct sum of R0. So Li1, for example, is where the uh, is one side of the solution. And it is it would be a direct sum of a finite number of irreps, with each irrep having its own spin. And um, so the time time dependence of the solution is completely contained in the in the instant on profile, and for the self dual instant on this uh, this function is one at tau equal to minus infinity and minus one uh, or sorry zero at tau equal to infinity, while for the anti self dual it is it has the opposite, it's completely, phi a is just one minus phi s. So, so then the self-dual instant on solutions from uh, a solution tunnels from this vacua li1 at tau equals minus infinity to li2 at tau equals infinity, while the anti-self-dual instant on tunnels in the reverse direction. And for the equation to be satisfied, we must also have these two matrices to be uh, to commute. In fact, uh, we could have more general 
solutions, but they don't satisfy more general instant ones, but they don't satisfy the self dual analytic self dual solutions. So these are the only ones that are relevant for us. Um, anyway, so the instant on number is defined as tracy dot b with a uh, it is an integral of a total derivative. There is a factor of four that ensures there is an integer, and uh, this is found out to be this um, a sum over the different different. Uh, it is a function of the the Casimirs of the different representations occurring in this these LIs, and we can construct. But however, this this depends on the representations of each each individual block occurring in Li. So this is, if, even though it is a gauge invariant object, it is not really, it, uh, we cannot extract the information. Uh, I mean, we cannot express this charge completely in terms of the n, the dimension of the gauge group or, um, but however, we can construct, uh, we can define another object as a charge by defining um, a rescaled electric field. Note that we are not really re rescaling any electric field. We are just we are just defining another charge in terms of a separate uh, uh, observable, which is uh, which is obtained by rescaling just the electric field in each block by an object. Uh, which is de which depends on the Casimirs of that block, and uh, if we do that, then we can define a new charge which can which is given in terms of just the uh, which is which is finally expressible just in terms of the difference in the number of error reps occurring in uh, the solution two and the number of error reps occurring in the solution one. But so it might seem a bit artificial, but uh, we can convince ourselves that it is still an integral of a total time derivative, and it is something that uh, does not uh, depend on the details of the individual representation occurring in the instant on. But it is just a, uh, it is just this uh, difference in the in the total number of irreps. So we had to do this i suppose because the matrix model the our uh, we we don't have uh, the vacua and the instant tones they don't occur having a for each value of an integer z so there are only a finite number of instant tones with with arbitrary spacing between them like if we if we uh, calculated the instant on numbers for SU3, say we would get two, two, four, and six, or uh, something like that. We, or, I mean, sorry, we'd, we got one, two, and six, so there is no pattern between them. But this tau new is something that is that follows a certain pattern. Anyway, we will find out why this new charge is important later. So now that we have set up the instantons. Let us describe the index of the Dirac operator. So in terms, so we can define the index of the Dirac operator in terms of the chirality of its zero modes. So the Dirac operator is Hermitian and it also anti-commutes with gamma five. The, so consequently for every eigenfunction with a non-zero eigenvalue, there, uh, there is an eigenfunction gamma five with uh, of psi n with the negative of that eigenvalue. And since the Dirac operator is Hermitian, these two uh, eigenfunctions are, uh, are orthogonal to each other. However, this is not true for the zero modes. So the zero, zero modes uh, uh, satisfy uh, zero, uh, they are the eigenfunctions with zero eigenvalue. And we can make linear combinations with definite chirality like this. But in general, the number of 
uh, zero moons with uh, positive chirality and the number of zero moons with negative chirality need not be equal. And uh, the index of d slash is defined as n plus minus n, uh, the difference between them. Uh, one can convince oneself that it is exactly the same as the number of zero modes of D minus the number of zero modes of D dagger. It, it is the same definition. Uh, so now let's express uh, it in the while basis. Let's expand this out in terms of two component uh, spinner operators. So then we have a Euclidean Dirac operator of this form. Mm with uh, with the with each l being this and each of them can be diagonalized and brought to a diagonal form because it's just uh, because this uh, of this matrix sigma i ai plus 3 by 2 we can diagonalize it with constant uh, with const with uh, time independent eigen vectors so we can just uh, find so all the time dependence is only in the eigenvalues of the matrix. And so positive and negative chirality zero modes are of this form. Uh, one is a right-handed, uh, only the right-handed component exists and the other one, only the left-handed one exists. And this satisfies, uh, the positive one satisfies LD equals zero, the other one satisfies LD dagger equals zero. So the index is again, uh, so an equivalent is again, uh, an equivalent is the kernel. Sorry, Bahul, the number it, of zero kernel. The number of um, there's some echo. Can I ask, well, is, it, is, it easy to, is it easy to see why the eigenvectors are time independent? Uh, you can just explicitly find this uh, uh, AI are just, this, uh, if, you, if you have just, put in the instant on solution, put in the instant on solution, then it is just, uh, then it is just an, a representation of uh, S, S, uh, SU2 algebra, right? So then these, this matrix is nothing but uh, this angular momentum addition, you can, express it in terms of the Cassini, like it's an addition of angular momentum with spin half and the and the spin in each rep that occurs in this AI. Uh, I, I and one can choose all uh, the, f the only time dependence enters in the phase which you can eliminate. Yeah, the only time dependence yeah. actually in yeah, AI yeah. is through this instant on profile and not in the matrices li so the time so then the eigen vectors are completely uh, time independent but and the only time dependence occurs in the the shape of the wave function so okay um and so now, um, yeah, as I said the only time dependence occurs in the shape of this wave function, but it uh, multiplies a constant uh, matrix, uh, sorry, constant vector. And uh, we have shown a pictorial representations uh, of the zero mode solution uh, explicitly. So the left pictures are when we are, uh, are looking at the self dual background and the right pictures are looking at the self anti dual background so as we can see for n greater than 3 so this is for n n is uh, and this is for nr equals 3 so there there is only one zero mode that is normalizable it's not seen very well but uh, but actually it uh, there is degeneracy two in this normalizable solution. And uh, for the self anti-dual, there is, uh, so, and uh, this one is, I think the one with chirality negative. And in the self anti-dual background, only the chirality, the positive chirality solution is normalizable. And we can, we can see by inspection of these equation that the degeneracy of that solution is two, but and for uh, 
but for blocks of dimension two, we don't find completely normalizable solutions, but we do find uh, one state which is like a scattering state or a resonance, which takes a finite value at negative infinity and goes to zero and so on. So we will deal with that. We will come to, they will also be relevant later in our discussion. But anyway, this is just to give you a picture of the solution. Whereas it turns out we do not have to make an in-depth uh, study of the individual solutions. We can use, uh, for a Dirac operator of this form, there is a very elegant, uh, neat way to determine the index by studying only the eigenvalues at the boundaries at tau equals plus minus infinity. This is due to Callias. Uh, so he defines the index in terms of the resolvent of these operators, LD dagger LD. Uh, and if we evaluate this uh, for our case, then we get that it's nothing but the sign of the, uh, the difference in the signs of the eigenvalue uh, psi zeta at tau equal to minus infinity and at tau equal to infinity over all the 2n uh, solution, 2n eigenvalues. So this suggests that the index only care about the boundary values. So we apply this to a simple case where one of these, uh, one the instant on tunnels between the vacuum m a equal to zero to uh, uh, an irrep, uh, so a reducible representation of SU2. So Li at one end uh, is Z is just the trivial configuration, L a equal, all gauge fields equal to zero. And one of them is an air, is a reducible representation. So for that, Let's say Li has R0 irreducible blocks uh, of SU2, uh, SU2 Lie algebra. Each block has dimension and R is uh, given in terms of the spin in each block as 2j plus 1. So then, as I said, sigma Ai is, can just be computed, the matrix is, can just be computed via uh, addition of uh, angular momentum algebra. And it is a 2n dimensional matrix. It has n minus one, nr minus one degenerate eigenvalues. So this is for each block. So each block has nr minus one degenerate eigenvalues of this form and nr plus one degenerate eigenvalues of uh, this form. Uh, yeah, so this would be if, if you had, uh, uh, if like this is, basically adding angular momenta jr with spin half of uh, sigma i. So these are the matrices for jr minus half and these are the matrices for jr plus half. So then now, uh, now we uh, plug in these solutions in this equation. So for the second term uh, at tau equal to uh, for, for solutions of this form, they have the same sign at both tau equal to minus infinity and plus infinity. So they don't contribute to the index. So only the solutions of the first type uh, contribute to the index and we can work it out to be um, of this form. So for the self-dual and the anti-self-dual solution, the index are opposite to each other. And this is uh, it. So if so R goes from one to R zero. R zero is the number of uh, blocks in uh, in the Li, and each of them contribute a finite number to the index. So for blocks with n R uh, blocks of size greater than two, this term in the bracket is simply two. Uh, so there exists just n R, uh, and uh, if we also went back and uh, went back and examined the solutions. Uh, uh, like depicted in the pictures, we would see that there were there were just nr minus one normalizable zero modes with one chirality. So for the self-dual, it's just the plus chirality exists, and for mine anti-self-dual, just the negative one. And then 
none with the opposite chirality. So the index is just given by sum over all nr minus one for those. For blocks with nr plus e equals one, there are no zero, normalizable zero modes and the index contribution is zero. But for the blocks with nr equals two, it seems at first sight that the index is undefined. And these are the cases which we have shown here where at one boundary, the, uh, the this uh, one eigenvalue of beta vanishes and then the Dirac operator just resembles a free particle at that boundary. So these solutions, uh, the corresponding zero mode is, uh, is a zero energy, it's not strictly normalizable, but it's a resonance or a threshold state. Uh, this is also defined in in Calias's index theorem, and uh, these are delta function normalizable. So, in this uh, yeah, so in this uh, uh, paper by Calias, uh, it we have to extend our definition of the index to take into account both the normalizable zero modes and the zero energy resonances. And we'll see that they both contribute to the non-invariance of the, the fermionic uh, measure. So if we do that, then we can uh, write down the index as simply n minus r naught, where n is the size of the gauge group, the dimension of the gauge group, and r naught is the number of irreps of SU2 occurring in the in our instant on background. And for the more general instant on where, uh, which tunnels between two different, in, uh, two different irreps of SU2, the index is simply the, the number of irreps occurring in, each, the difference in the number of irreps occurring in each. And what we find is that this is the same as the new topological charge of the instant on background that we have defined. So this is, you may call it a matrix model version of the Atya Singer index theorem. So it is not, uh, not, the, not the actual instant on number, the index, but this new charge that we define. Okay, and now we complete our, our argument by adapting Fujikawa's method to demonstrate the axial anomaly via the change in the measure. So the fermionic path integral, this measure is given by d psi bar d psi, size are the fermionic fields. Uh, we expand these fermionic variables in terms of the eigenfunctions of d bar uh, of d slash. So these contain the ones with non-zero eigenvalues, zero modes, and we also um, uh, take the zero energy resonances. And we take a complete basis and we just use the delta function normalization for the resonances. And the path integral measure is then uh, given, expanded in when we expand the field in this way, is just uh, a product over all these coefficients A and Vm. So we can uh, express the measure in terms of these variables, these coefficients. Now let us make a U1 axial rotation to the power i alpha gamma five to the uh, to to these uh, fields or uh, to these fermionic variables and uh, what they do is that they transform the coefficients and uh, but the coefficients transform linearly and how the measure changes is given by the jacobian of this transformation it's just uh, the determinant of c inverse and uh, this, uh, if we use the completeness relation, it is just given by this, uh, e, uh, this function, e to the minus i integral of d tau alpha is the, is the angle by which we have rotated in terms of this, um, this quantity, the anomaly function, which is nothing but the trace of the gamma, of the gamma five matrix uh, expressed in terms of the eigenfunctions uh, uh, of uh, d slash. So now there are, the summation is over an infinite number of eigenfunctions modes. And so it's divergent. So we we introduce a gauge invariant regulator e to the minus beta d slash square. 
And then in the end, after we have evaluated, we formally take the limit beta 10 going to zero at the end. So this is what we define to be our anomaly function. And uh, if we do that, then uh, in the end, uh, if if we use a to evaluate, uh, if we use this to evaluate a, what we do find is that for non-zero eigenvalues, these eigenfunctions are orthogonal. Uh, eigenfunction, as we have uh, said before, gamma n and uh, uh, these. Uh, Phi n and gamma phi acting on phi n give uh, mutually uh, give eigenvalues which are negative of each other and Dirac operator is Hermitian so they are orthogonal. So the trace of gamma phi between these two they are it's zero, so it does they do not contribute to the summation. So only the zero modes and the zero energy resonances have non-zero contribution to AT. And for a given value of the uh, the way of alpha, the integrated anomaly function is evaluated by taking, uh, like if if we if we put in the regulator properly and then take it to zero, then we can we show that it can it is evaluated to be exactly the difference in the number of uh, negative and the positive chirality zero modes, and which is exactly the index. So what we have, we have done three steps. We have uh, shown that the, the measure of the integral uh, changes by the index, uh, um, by, a, by a value which depends on the index of the Dirac operator and the index of the Dirac operator in a, an instant on background is non-zero and it is related to a suitable, suitably defined charge of the instant on. So thus in a background configuration where the Dirac operator has non-zero index, the fermion measure is not invariant and axial symmetry is broken anomalously. Also, this index is always an integer. So um, the anomaly function vanishes, the phase vanishes on, when this uh, alpha, the angle of axial rotation um, is uh, an integer multiple of n. Uh, so for axial rotations with alpha equals n pi, in integral multiple of pi. So, and this is true for any any size of the, uh, any dimension of the gauge field. So then the U1 is anomalously broken to a Z2 sub, Z2 subgroup, which is the residual axial symmetry. And we have worked with only one flavor, but if we, uh, if we introduce NF flavors of fermion, because the Dirac operator is diagonal in flavor, every eigenvalue, everything in the spectrum just uh, has NF copies. And now the axial symmetry is broken to Z2 NF. So this is, uh, this is the same result as is um, found for the actual Yang-Mills uh, theory and the full field theory as well is found in the literature. Okay, now, so this is basically argument. Now we sketched the argument briefly for adjoint wild fermions. So for adjoint wild fermions, this is the Euclidean action. And this Fi is uh, is basically the uh, the represent the representation of uh, this in, these instant on solutions embedded in n square minus one dimensions. And uh, so we can we can easily derive uh, we can easily embed our solution uh, solutions ai into n square minus dimensions and work out the forms of fi but uh, whatever it is we don't care these are still of of the form uh, these are still of of this general form where j ji are also a direct sum of a uh, of a finite number of Ir irreducible representations of SU2 so that the total dimension is n square minus one. So all our arguments go through exactly similarly. We can again define uh, a rescaled uh, electric field in each separate block. 
and uh, the new instant on charge is the same as the number, the difference in ERIPs. And uh, the index calculation is also the same, and the uh, number of the non invariance of path integral measure is also the same. So basically, the anomaly uh, in argument in the in, for adjoint fermions is exactly the same as that of fundamental fermions. Only these uh, cues, the number of irreps, the, uh, the basic functions, they are different, but the argument is the same. But here, uh, there is one, one specific difference, which is that uh, these, uh, the sizes of these irreps and so on, like all eigenvalues of d slash are doubly degenerate. So the index would, would be uh, all, always an even integer. This is because for every eigenvector psi in with, and there exists an independent eigenvector uh, which is basically the time uh, the time reversal symmetry acting on phi n, the same eigenvalue. So this is Kramer's degeneracy. This is well known for the case of a joint fermion. So the index is always an even integer. We have explicitly seen this too. So the residual symmetry is actually Z4 rather than just Z2. And for NF flavors, the residual symmetry is set for NF. So here is where our, um, our result vary from uh, the known results, with, which is, so there that is also the said, the residual symmetry is just is said NC, but we just have a Z4 subgroup that is unbroken. Uh, so anyway, this, uh, this brings us to the conclusion. So we can summarize that the axial anomaly is present in the quantum mechanical Yangman's matrix model also. We have tracked it down to the non invariance of the path integral measure under an axial rotation of fermion in an instant on background. And this gives us an integrated anomaly equation, which is uh, integrated anomaly, which is just the index of the Dirac operator in the instant on background. So this breaks anomalously breaks uh, the U1 axial symmetry to uh, Z, uh, Z2NF or a Z4NF background, uh, depending on which fermions, which representation of fermions are not looking at. And also the index is related to a new instant on charge defined in terms of a rescaled field. This gives us a matrix model version of the Asinger theorem too. And so we uh, we have see, shown that the index is present in terms of um, for all even for all representations of fermions. So it would be present in supersymmetric theories as well. So these could have possible implications for the BFSs, um, BMN, the matrix models that are usually studied as well. So it could be an interesting uh, study uh, too. And uh, in another work that is still ongoing, we also have found evidence to believe that the chiral symmetry is also broken in the matrix model, but that is uh, something that is still under progress. But if we can, if we manage to show uh, that as well, that completes the picture that the matrix model does uh, capture the symmetry properties of the field, field theory as well. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for a very nice talk, uh, Mahul. And um, it's open to questions. I have a couple of questions. Mm. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, Please. Um, first of all, so I'm wondering, is there a is there any hidden connection to the scheme uh, model? I mean, because uh, if I can, I can you go back to your equation ten? I was curious to. Sorry, uh, your volume is very low. So... Ah, sorry. I, I okay. So I can you hear me? A little more, maybe, if you increase. More. Uh, now. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I was wondering if there is. Uh, any relation or even connection to the Skirme model? Um, because if I look at your equation 10, in your- uh, Equation model, 10, okay. Yes, 
um, the potential that you have, this, the last term, for instance, this, uh, the bracket mm -hmm. squared, it's also something that appear in the SU2 uh, chiral uh, schema model for uh, nucleon mm -hmm. interaction. And also the second term, this AI square looks like, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the kinematical part of the schema model. So I was uh, just wondering if, because also you're looking for the low energy limit, right, of the young Mills theory. Yeah, yeah. And also, the, the schema model for baryons is a, basically mm. a sort of a low energy effective field theory. Um, and just because they look, uh, I mean, at least part of this, your uh, model looks like, uh, you know. Yeah, it is, it is actually very close uh, yeah. to this. Uh, I was just wondering if there is a, a deeper uh, relation between these two things or. Yeah, we could definitely uh, study this from that point of view. Maybe um, this uh, potential, if if a few terms of them are missing, then then the structure of the vacuum will be a little different. For example, uh, even uh, if if we just made a made a dimension reduction on the torus, then I think only this the quartic term would survive, okay, okay. and then the vacuum would just be uh, for commu just commuting matrices that would have a different than uh, in the square model AI, AI is a pure gauge it is you would yes. add AI, but it, it is not that here okay it is no, I, I in that limit in what in one uh, uh, takes the, the pure gauge limit of this model indeed so if one can reconstruct the, the actually here our AIs if you looked at it from a lattice point of view the AIs live lived on the sites and it is this a0 which live on the uh, on the uh, the links no, no there are extra terms for sure uh, hmm. i mean just uh, okay okay but you clarify so ais are basically like fields which uh, they are not parallel transporters okay okay I see, I see. Hmm. um and the second question is about the calias index theorem so uh, for what i know the calias index theorem is well defined only for open manifolds not for different from the atia singer that is defined for, uh, you know, a compact manifold. So yeah, we, but we have, uh, we are working on uh, S3 cross R. Our R is not compact. Ah, exactly. So I was trying to understand. Exactly. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. it's just because your R is not compact, and then you can use the Calias index. Theory, yeah. Right? Because yeah. otherwise, if you compactify the time, then mm -hmm. I think you will not get uh, any information from the Calias, uh, correct? Yeah, I, I think uh, we cannot use that, but we could still uh, study the, we could still, st all of these, uh, all of these, they were independent of it. We could make an independent study of, uh, just that it would be more diff more tricky, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is a, Calias index theorem is a neat way to get, determine the index in this particular. Yeah, because your tau goes to infinity, right? That that is the point. Yeah. And there we could, there actually the A0, the gauge field uh, that uh, we have actually taken the temporal gauge, we have set it to zero. There right. it would play a picture. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mohul, Somebody can you have tell another me? question that they want? Mohul, can you tell me? Can you tell us? I, I don't quite follow. Can you tell us? Do, uh, I, I there is an echo. Yeah, there is an echo. I can hear it. <laughs> From Danjo. Okay. How did you get infinite number of modes? My mic is off, so. <laughs> mm. I mean, it's a finite dimensional matrix model. How did infinite number of modes come in the picture? Oh, uh, sorry, I am. Um, uh, the number of the non zero eigenvalues. Ah. Just a minute. Are we talking about this? Uh, why we needed to do this? Yeah. This, yeah. this is the, Actually, it this is the uh, yeah. path integral formulation, Bal. Okay. Yeah, this is it's, the path, it's path, path, path integral formulation. formulation. So you have yeah, an infinite number. Mm -hmm. No, you expand the, the fields in terms of a finite number of modes. So it's just, it's just that product she wrote in terms of the ANs. 
Very yeah, but uh, well, uh, yeah, she has a there are there are there is an infinite, uh, I mean, like there is a, there is an infinite number of paths that we could take in uh, Sai and Cybot, right? So this would be. Uh, and in each path, we expanded it in terms of these. So, the in in that direction, the values of a n and b n that we got would could expand it would be over an infinite value. So what do you mean by path here? Like uh, this, uh, like this measure, the psi bar, the psi. I mean, this is over all possible field configuration. Okay, but the number of field configurations in the matrix model is finite. I mean, it is given by the ANs. Your no, no, each, no each it's infinite. Each field configuration, we uh, we expand it in terms of AN, but the number of expansions is still infinite. In that sense, we were talking about it. You, you, uh, well, 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 the path, the fermion, the fermionic determinant is infinite dimensional. That fermionic determinant you get when in, you integrate out the fermions is infinite dimensional. Okay, I don't, okay, I let you think about it, but uh, I just want to make a remark that um, mm -hmm. the presence of the anomaly mm -hmm. finite dimensional matrix models, it has already appeared quite clearly in the fuzzy sphere. Okay where it comes without any path integration from the projective modules. I mean, to define the Dirac operator, mm. when you um, expand the uh, domain of the operator to a projective module. Okay? And that shows, depending on the particular projective, so you have to, um, so depending on the particular projective module, you get difference between left and right modes. Okay? So mm. one can do it purely directly without any path integration, okay? I think that that can be done here also. I don't, I have not thought it, thought about, thought about it, but mm. I think it can be done. But uh, So does it uh, come across as a domain issue, a domain problem? Yes, uh, it is in that book we wrote, I wrote with Sachin and Sechkin. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, sorry. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, there was an interruption, sorry. Okay, so, um, uh, Sachin knows the proof. It is in that book. Okay? So, uh, you know, question I want to ask is the since the modes are different, the number of left and right hmm. zero modes are different. Okay? Hmm. One would expect a priori that there is a breakdown of the uh, chiral symmetry. Okay? Hmm. Is that where you are looking for a breakdown? Actually, the chiral symmetry, uh, yeah, we we show that the vacuum is uh, the the vacuum configuration. It is uh, it is not invariant under SU two L and SU two R. So yeah, so we make an uh, make a chiral rotation again in a similar way, and we see that the vac vacuum. Uh, configuration breaks it. So the number of modes which annihilates the vacuum is different for left and right modes. Yeah, yeah so the... So that should give the anomalies, isn't it? Uh, the breakdown or uh, chiral symmetry. Is... is uh, does it have to do with the zero modes? Which, uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm... The other modes, they cancel. Uh, Bal, I think the confusion is that uh, for me as well, maybe also for Mahul, is that there are two effects in play here. One is that the, there is an axial anomaly and the other is that there is spontaneous symmetry breaking of, of SU2 left cross SU2 right to SU2 diagonal or SUN left cross SUN right to SUN diagonal. So these are two if I understand low energy QCD correctly, these are two distinct effects. These are two distinct properties of the low energy sector, low energy vacuum of QCD, right? 
they are uh, they are intertwined but they are not uh, they are not one and the same so what we have shown is that uh, there is a breaking of there is an anomalous breaking of the axial symmetry uh, the chiral symmetry if by chiral symmetry breaking you mean su nf left cross su nf right breaking to the diagonal subgroup then uh, in usual field theory discussions this is via spontaneous symmetry breaking which means that the ground state of the theory does not respect uh, this symmetry and the ground state only respects the diagonal symmetry the diagonal. so that uh, i mean these of course are deeply interlinked but nevertheless i think in at a conceptual level distinct phenomena yeah, i am getting getting confused on this okay. um, in the quantum field theory discussions yeah. uh, the chiral symmetry breakdown and the uh, uh, anomaly are strictly related okay uh, they are also related to confinement okay now what i am thinking is the vac the vacuum you are one is constructing okay either here or in fuzzy sphere models is given by the zero modes so let me do with real time okay they are given by the zero modes okay, okay. so um, the there is an asymmetry between the left and the right zero modes in the vacuum okay as uh, available in the zero mode sector so <coughs> the vacuum that one constructs there are many possibilities one can populate it with equal number of left and right or unequal numbers okay so depending on how one populates it it kaiser's kaiser symmetry will be either preserved by that uh, vector state or it will be broken that's what i think okay? but i don't quite know how to connect it to kaiser symmetry let me say i am confused but let us talk about it later mm. Okay. Um, because there is an asymmetry between left and yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, because there is an asymmetry between left and right. One of them, uh, the chiral yeah. symmetry breaking is not. Uh, it's not anomalously broken. Not, so it's not anomalously. It's just broken, broken by the ground state. Huh. So the measure. The uh, I mean, there is a echo. I think measure, somebody. Uh, I mean, there is a echo. I think. I think, I think, think it's Tenjo's mic. Tenjo's mic. Mm. Okay, continue more. Mm. yeah so uh, so that does not uh, in like in particular it it would not affect the the, the path integral measure the spontaneous yeah. symmetry breaking so let me do real time okay yeah so the ground state in the real time the zero modes are there in the zero uh, real time also okay? mm -hmm. that's coming from as i told you in the fuzzy case it is the, coming from the projective module okay? you can see so the vacuum what you call call the ground state is degenerate mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. uh, either define it with uh, i mean depends upon how one there are many vacua many ground states available in the problem okay mm -hmm. so uh, there is there was a problem like this which was uh, discussed by jacky long ago okay then he chose the vacuum to preserve cp or time reversal okay mm -hmm. then he got an answer but there is no reason you can choose it you, there are many possibilities you can choose okay and uh, develop the theory like that so uh, i'm at this moment i am confused depending on how you choose the vacuum in these models by vacuum i mean the ground state in the real time formulation there will be either a um, uh, chiral anomaly or no chiral anomaly i mean chiral anomaly in the vacuum yeah there also the number of cancellations will change okay? uh, mm. yeah. and also the chiral symmetry whether the vacuum is invariant will change the, uh, the amount it changes will depend upon what you call the vacuum okay? there are many of them okay? um, mm. uh, i am wondering whether that is related to the path integral thing is uh, conceals what exactly is happening in quantum mechanics okay Um, it is a, such a formal activity okay? so it conceals the reality okay? in, my, in my opinion but um, i am wondering i am not sure about all this 
maybe somebody in his nose. But anyway, the talk was extremely clear. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody else may want to ask a question. Just, Bernard, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have two related questions. Uh, one is, uh, you said uh, you choose the, uh, the volume or the radius to one, and also you choose the coupling constant equal to one. Hmm. Now, uh, for, of course, topological questions, uh, all your discussion about the incidental numbers and so on, uh, this is irrelevant. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you, you have a scale uh, in, yeah. in your system, and you, you can change the scale either by uh, changing the coupling constant or by changing the volume. Um, so the, the other question is, uh, your theory, your matrix model, presumably uh, should be some approximation to three-dimensional Electrodynamic, uh, quantum electro, uh, quantum chromodynamics uh, on a sphere, mm. and um, last time we we talked about it. Uh, I think Sinead Ryan said it would be difficult uh, to implement that uh, on a sphere, but still uh, one could approximate the sphere by an icosahedron, and uh, then uh, the the calculational load would be very manageable. So. Uh, I, I I would suggest uh, that uh, you you talk to some uh, lattice people or so, uh, just to compare uh, how well the the icosahedral model, the results for the icosahedron would would agree uh, with yours. Then one certainly could uh, could estimate uh, to uh, how how close you are uh, to to three-dimensional quantum chromodynamics. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, when we were uh, looking at the global spectrum, for example, uh, what we matched with the data, and they were using, uh, the, uh, they, were they were also using a polyhedron to, uh, to de define the, yeah. I, I think it's a similar. Well, okay. uh, the lattice people use uh, a, a cubic lattice. So um, the results they get uh, are classified the according, get to, are, uh, according to representations of the cubic group, cubic, the, that discrete group. And uh, uh, the, uh, if you want to assign properties like spin to, to, their, to the uh, spectra of particles that they find, then that cannot be assigned except at the uh, uh, continuum limit. So there is uh, the lattice people, I think, spend some amount of effort in uh, discussing the continuum limit and discussing how the representations of the cubic lattice, uh, representations of the cubic group sit inside or uh, match up with the representations of SO3 in the continuum limit. In our case, uh, we did do. Uh, uh, we have we have a uh, we can directly approach the question of uh, the predicting the spectra the spectrum of this uh, this model by doing variational calculations and this is I think the slide that Mohul showed early on. Uh, this is in response to uh, 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 Professor Werner Nam's question about uh, how it matches up with uh, either the lattice people or maybe more precisely how it matches, how our results match up with the real world. And uh, if Amahul can show us the this fourth or the fifth slide, then you can mm -hmm. see, for example, uh, predictions from the matrix model, which are black dots with error bars, uh, compared with the experimental values. So you can see that we do very well, except for the K on the eta and the eta prime. These are three values for which we do, these are three particles for which we, we are, our predictions are very far off from the real world values but for all the other all the other particles 
the uh, all the other uh, light hadron particles the predictions are quite good and as mohul said uh, within uh, 30 to 10% and a couple of particles i think our predictions are in within 1% uh, so like the proton please. yeah like the new for the nucleon i think the prediction is within 1% so uh, the, the these uh, problematic ones the kaon the eta and the eta prime we feel that if we took a bigger and a bigger or perhaps maybe a better variational ansatz we would move closer to the real world values and actually it is this this graph that encouraged us to look for the anomaly in the matrix model because the classical matrix model has both the chiral symmetry as well as the su nf left cross su nf right symmetry on the other hand our numerical work showed that we are doing quite well as far as predicting the masses of the light hadrons is concerned which means that the quantum matrix model should somehow know about the both the chiral anomaly as well as the spontaneous symmetry breaking of sunf left cross sunf right so uh, we think that we have provided half the answer by showing that the chiral anomaly exists even in the matrix model and the other half which is to show that this spontaneous symmetry breaking takes place is the work that is in progress so i mean in, in some sense our just, search just for the chiral in some sense our yeah please go on denjo oh yeah i just wanted to do, to comment because i think it's related uh, in mahul's uh, presentation she found that she needed to renormalize the electric field now the computation of the anomaly is not sensitive to the actual form of the uh, matrix model action so it suggests that you may need to change the matrix model action a little bit can can you show us the renormalized um electric field again mahul oh uh, yeah sure this uh, equation 17 uh each in, in each prime, block yeah no uh, yeah. each in each block it is can, uh, can each, you feed is, uh, is is there a That's, way of obtaining e prime for the generic matrix can you find a rescaling mm. uh that might match that's mm. a good idea because you can feed you could potentially feed that back idea. into yeah so that it uh, matches this when we are looking at an instant term yes mm. yes yeah it the other be... question i had was uh, did you yeah it would be uh sorry go on uh, sorry uh, you uh, can you get that anomaly by a triangle graph can you get the anomaly by a, from a triangle graph computation uh that would be uh, in uh, present uh, presence in absence of space to work out how that would be just in the temporal direction can you define the triangle graph Uh, yeah just take that take that triangle graph to see if it's i mean you're mm -hmm. you're approximating four dimensional uh qcd so you might try uh, yeah we have not all the, of the modes it's topological quantity yeah, that comes out so the, so okay we could try that so the all the glue glue momenta would have to be zero right yes potentially you, you may need to feed in this uh, this e this uh, sort of rescaled action to get uh, to get the correct one presumably you would yeah but i i want just want to make sure that if anyone else th that has to leave wants to ask a question uh, that they have a chance uh, i know tom usually leaves so if you have a question tom you may want to
I think we're too late. He has left already. Okay, go ahead. Anyone else want to ask a question before? So uh, I, yeah, I then, just had one comment, uh, I, which is that uh, um, usually in the formulation of the index theorem, uh, it's the irreducible connections and the topological charge of the irreducible connections, which gets related to the um, Dirac index. Here we found that uh, um, it's not just the irreducible connections that matter. We found that the reducible connections also play a role. And it's only when you take the reducible connections into account that the index theorem for the matrix model seems to work out in the form that uh, Mohul presented. So uh, in that sense, I think the index theorem that uh, we that she presented here is, uh, a little bit more mysterious than the usual version of the index theorem that we know, that the usual version of the Atya Singer index theorem that we know. Here we need to know not just the irreducible ones, but even the reducible ones. And all of them play into compute into, into the index. Why do you say that, Sachin? Suppose I put trace of F with Jeff, okay? Okay. where F is direct sum of the connection there is a direct sum of connections in several irreducibles. Right. The bundle is at infinity. So you are getting a bundles on S3. Now it will be the direct, but it's the Whitney sum of several bundles at infinity. That's all. Okay. So the connect the uh, the bundle is uh, quite, I mean, if you have one uh, uh, monopole bundle, you have several monopole bundles by taking the Whitney sums. Likewise, here you will get SU2 bundles, okay? but there will be Whitney sums. So one can recover the whole um, anomaly structure, which is uh, embedded, which is really consequence of this bundle. Okay? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, think you're right. right. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to support what Bal says there. I mean, that seems to be obvious that that's what's going on. Also, because you've got no space derivatives, um, you could think of the kind of matrixology has been contributed to by uh, what's usually called a twisted operator, which is really just tensoring with the bundle. Which, and again, it's just another bundle, as Pal says. So that will give you a normalizations in the structure of your term. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 might, very, it might be very well what you say. Uh, but uh, of course, for us, the surprise is that you can even get an index theorem or an anomaly in the point of mechanical model. Why do you why are you surprised? We found it in fuzzy yeah. here with George. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, of course. <laughs> but uh, this, no, I, we did not expect to find such a precise relation between uh, a topological quantity constructed out of just the instant on and the number of zero modes of the Dirac operator. They are but those are the ingredients of the index theorem. You should expect it. Hmm. I think Charlie is quite. Yeah. I, I, what I do, I would like to know is where is the projective module? I mean, let us do everything in real time because yeah. um, where is the projective module? Because the bundles are coming from projective modules. The anomaly is coming from projective modules. So you are Modules. taking your. Uh, so you are taking. There is again an echo. Denjo, I think, yeah. is coming from. So your matrices and when you uh, is acting on some vector space V, but when you try to go to the uh, Dirac operator also, you have to enhance it by tensoring it with a um, uh, bigger space and projecting down to the uh, particular dimension you want. That's right. So one gets a projective module, and um, what happens is that this module is non-trivial. The projection yeah. is, um, so that should be happening here also. Yeah, so uh, you want, so I guess we want an equation like, you want an equation like Q dot is equal to instant on charge 
or integral of constant on charge, right? They are actually only constant time. numbers. Okay. Look at the number of zero modes of one chirality and the other and took the difference. Okay. Yeah. That was the end of the story there. Yeah. I think that it should be the case I here. But aren't the, well, aren't, the, aren't the projective modules uh, precisely the projections onto uh, these left and right vector bundles over then in S3, these ones that, um, is it, uh, um, that are giving... Um, it, I mean, they, um, the, the S3 is built up from projective modules over S2. In the way here they have done it. Decide, okay, I don't know. Hmm. This I don't know. I think uh, that uh, yes, the two projective modules for left and right parallel data operators is coming from the projectors, which are slightly different. Okay. Um, then one looks at the. Uh, uh, Modes with zero eigenvalue for the data operator. Hello. Yeah, uh, Bal, I wanted to ask you uh, what is the Bal, I wanted yes. to ask you uh, what is the how do you see the anomaly in in a real time formulation? As I say, the see, here I have to recollect uh, as we in the fuzzy sphere case. No, we found no, it I in mean real time. in Yang Mills, in full Yang Mills plus the fermions. Ah, zero modes. Count is zero modes. There are theorems on zero modes. You know? So uh, uh, the, one can count the zero modes. They are, uh, in, I think in that case it is S4. Yeah, it is S4. But that's Euclidean. Uh, no, no. The, 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 um, no, it is Euclidean, yeah. The, uh, he, want, no, he, he wants to do it in, in Hamiltonian formulation. Yeah, Hamiltonian formulation. But the modes, the what is it, the bundles are happening on a compact manifold. Okay? In that here, single theorem. Okay? So, I think the bundles are insensitive to the metric. So, we are not considering F, F squared and so on. Just um, look at the possible bundles on S4. That uh, shows just like uh, UN bundles on S2 is coming from some direct string on S1. Here, uh, the SU2 bundles will come from some, uh, uh, some north pole or south pole of S4. Okay? Um, so, you, I mean, the connection will not be well defined there, won't have a unique value, and you will get a bundle. Okay? So, this is a, and this you can check then by the standard index theory that they are exactly equal to the number of zero modes okay? or the Dirac operator on this S4, but there's no metric. Um, this is not a metrical question, it's a bundle question. No? Yeah, but, but you're, you're doing a Euclidean analysis there, Bob. What I mean is you need a- that, That's precise. What I mean is you need a, the, the Atiyah Singer theorem applies as said, is on a compact manifold. It does not apply if you take non-compact manifolds. Then um, um, uh, you need some other index theorem. I don't know. She said Cali Callias. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Callias, I thought, was related to Higgs fields. There's another confusion that I had. Okay. Callias index theorem came in the context of zero modes of Higgs field. When you have a mass with the Higgs field coupling, coupling. I think that is an application of Kalias. Could be. Uh, that is my recollection. That uh, but, paper I remember reading. But it is more. But it is more abstract than that. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, Atiyah Singer only applies to compact manifolds. There of course, not, yes. No compact version, but like Kalias, but. Atiyah Singer applies only to, uh, to compact manifolds. So uh, when uh, when she said that the index of the Dirac operator is equal to the instant on charge and that being identified, that is the only sense in which uh, we may mean that this is the 
matrix model version of the Atiyah Singer index theorem. Because on the on one side you compute uh, the number of zero modes, which is some functional analytic properties of a differential operator, and on the other side you compute uh, something which is purely um, property of the gauge vacuum of the two gauge vacua. The fact that these two are equal to each other, not merely related to each other, is uh, the sense in which uh, we use the phrase matrix model version of Atiyah Singer index theorem. The, the fact that they are actually equal to each other, not just, yeah. So, but you are, you are absolutely right. The, Atiyah Singer index theorem is for compact manifolds, S2 or S4, or typically even dimensional, but probably all with some with some variation also for our, I don't know, you can do it for odd, odd dimensional manifolds. Yeah, there are- It would be interesting to study this in, uh, uh, when time is compact, as Gian Domenico said, like it'll be a finite temperature yeah, so that is one of the things that we have in mind, which is it take in the Euclidean picture, the tau direction is essentially the temperature direction, right? So instead of tau going from minus infinity to infinity, you take it from minus beta to beta. Then there are period, then you look for instanton solutions that are periodic up to gauge transformations. And they look for zero modes that are periodic up to gauge transformations. And then uh, you can, uh, one can ask whether there is a relationship between the instant on number and the number of zero modes. So then, so you, should get, then you should get a connection with the S3 picture for monopoles. I think you're, uh, yeah, that is a good guess. That is a good guess. I, but uh, from the physics point of view, it would tell us what happens to the anomaly at finite tem in a finite temperature situation. I think it'd be given by the spectral flow in three dimensions. In other words, the index of something on S3 cross I, 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 the I, index of something on S3 cross S1 is good. I, I think that's, but I think that would still be the case. Uh, if you looked at it from the Hamiltonian point of view, that would be the, uh, the answer Bal is looking for. Originally, it would be a, a big, you'd have to look at those monopole bundles. Yeah. I, I think I now begin to remember. <laughs> the real time, one has a certain number of zero modes, okay, which are different for left and right. Okay. Zero modes is, I think in the Hamiltonian formulation, they have zero energy. Okay. And now, so the vacuum is not uniquely defined. Okay. Um, one can populate the vacuum by certain either number of zero modes. So how does it show up in functional integral? So if the zero mode quantity numbers are say A and star and B and star for left and right, you, for the zero modes only, in the functional integral, uh, you retain a certain number of them. Then there are chiral selection rules. If you take the expectation value of psi bar gamma phi psi, uh, if you put all the zero modes, all the zero modes in the integration measure, it, the expectation value will vanish. The function integral will vanish. Um, these are the chiral selection rules. But if you just take away some of the zero modes, then psi bar gamma phi psi will not vanish. Okay? So um, what is and that corresponds to choosing another vacuum because you are only manipulating the vacuum. Okay? So what is unclear to me is. How is the vac the ground state picked out in these calculations? Uh, I know that Jack, this paper of Jackie in polyacetylene, it was in the polyacetylene case. He picked it out by uh, imposing a symmetry on the vacuum. Okay. Here I don't know. How does it pick the vacuum? You're, you're asking how does the physics pick the vacuum? Yes. Yes. Um, it, I think it's a, it, the same question is how do you, you have a background, uh, you have a background uh, Yang Mills field given by, by presumably these monopoles as Charles was mentioning. 
and you have you, the zero sector will presumably be the zero monopole sector. That when the two when, when the two are uh, have the same when uh, the index is zero, or there are no left zero modes and no right zero modes. Yeah. Yeah, you can choose or equal number. But, equal an number equal number right, should be sufficient. Uh, I, I'm equal not, number left and right. That that will be one sector, and but it, you've chosen a different physical situation. If you put in a, uh, if you put in a non-zero yeah. uh, index, <laughs> the, and you have to quantize the two sectors separately. Yeah, they are super selected. That's why that that seems very clear from the yeah, path integral. Selected. They're super selected exactly. Okay, that's also true in the in in the Euclidean Minkowski formulation. But then comes the question. In the continuum, what picks out the vacuum? Mm -hmm. in, the, in the continuum, you mean in uh, for true Yang Mills? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. This effects are there. Yeah. This effects are there. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I oh. it's just, uh, I don't. I, I mean, that's a very good question. It, it's it's related to the type of physics that people are doing in uh, in CERN at the moment, with this. Uh, what do they call it? These uh, chiral uh, current. In terms of these chiral currents, you presumably have a chiral current. You're talking about quark gluon plasma. Yeah, I presume so. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, these experiments in the, in the quark gluon plasma. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Even if it was, even if it was password free. And you, you, you have it. You set you. You have to set it up in different ways. You're setting up different boundary conditions for your quark gluon plasma. Yes. And I think I think there will be time. Uh, there'll be boundary conditions that uh, that are affect uh, at an initial time is probably sufficient. Mm. Okay. Okay. Are there other questions before I stop the recording? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mohul. Again, we can continue excellent. afterwards. Thanks, really excellent. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Yes, thank you, Mahol, and I'm going to stop the recording. And I hope Thanks for next your time. family.